you? It's good to be back. I was here four years ago, and the, you know, in the before times, uh, and it's nice to be back again. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about abstraction today because uh, abstraction turns out to be probably the most important thing uh, to being a good developer, to understand when to use it, what it's for, am I, am I doing it right, do I need more of it, and so on. And uh, I thought I would start, though, with some thank yous. I've been getting up on stages for about 20 years, and in most of that time, speakers get up and they tell you that they're going to spend an hour or an hour and a half with you and share wisdom with you. And it, it sounds like they thought it all up by themselves. It just came to them one day when they were at their desk for no good reason. And a few years ago, a Connor Hoekstra, and if you don't know Connor, I strongly recommend that you seek him out, uh, started doing talks where he said, I was watching this talk and I was reading this blog and I was listening to this podcast and I decided to put this piece of this together with this piece of that and that's what this talk is. And I realized that's how all talks happen, okay? Uh, we do something at work, we listen to something, we watch something, we talk to a friend over dinner and it turns into a talk. And Connor really started telling the truth about that instead of implying that we all just make all this stuff up in our ivory towers alone. Uh, so in that spirit, uh, last year, uh, Guy Davidson wrote this book. He likes to say that we wrote this book, but that's not really true. He wrote all the words. Um, I helped him to choose which of the 30 core guidelines, of which 30 of the hundreds of core guidelines we would talk about. And uh, you know, worked a little bit on you know, choosing examples, or maybe this paragraph should be before that paragraph, that kind of thing. But he really did all the work. And what we discovered, we chose the guidelines to cover a variety, not all the same stuff. But over and over and over again, they boiled down to, you should do this highly specific piece of C++ syntax. And the answer for why was always because that's better abstraction. It was like we said, it's just abstraction all the way down. Uh, also, Tony, a uh, Canadian like me, uh, did a talk at C++ Now last year, uh, which was allegedly about the solid principles. I'm kind of meh on the solid principles these days for a variety of reasons, but that's okay because the talk really wasn't about the solid principles at all. But it was about like designing and architecting uh, classes and abstractions, and I learned a lot from that talk as well. And I recommend you seek out talks by these three people. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Here's the thing. We teach abstraction. <coughs> we kind of lie. Here are the lies we tell people. You, you find your abstractions before you write your code. You have to write them down in some kind of a notation. Uh, I have books by people like Grady Booch that came with plastic templates in the back to help you draw the little shapes on paper, the lozenges and clouds and whatnot that represented the different uh, notations for, uh, for object orientation. And you need to understand whatever domain it is you're writing in. So my undergraduate work is in chemical engineering. So if I was going to model, as I did, <coughs> chemical reactors and refineries, you know, you have to understand how a heat exchanger works or how a pump works. That's how you can write good code to model one of those. And if you're going to write something that sells things to people and charges them sales tax, you need to understand the rules of sales tax, not just to write the code, but even to design it. So for example, in some countries, there is just a sales tax rate, period. In many countries, some things are taxable and some are not. And in others, there are different rates for different things. <coughs> so designing and saying every object will have a sales tax rate might not, in fact, be the correct design in some countries. And probably the biggest lie is that once you've done that, you're good. Going forward, if anything changes, they change the rules for sales tax or whatever, you'll just go to this one place and you'll change it. Sorry about my throat. Now, when I call these lies, right, they're really just simplifications. My granddaughter is five. She's learning to read. We tell her, this is the letter C. It makes a cuss sound. C for Chloe. C for cat. We don't tell her about Pacific Ocean. Where the C's in Pacific Ocean each make a different sound. And in the same way, like C is for Chloe and C does make a cuss sound for cat, but you're not a fluent reader of English if you pronounce all C's that way. 
there are other things going on for abstraction. The truth is, yeah, you do design and find some abstractions. And you do need a way to write it down when you don't have code. And you do need domain knowledge to discover them. But you're not done when you found those. You've just started. You're going to continue finding abstractions for as long as this software exists. And most importantly, you find those abstractions completely differently than the way you find them when you're designing, than the only way we've ever taught you to find them. So that's what I want to talk about in this talk, is finding missing abstractions in working code. You don't need to understand how chemical reactors work. You don't need to understand how to run a rental car business. Okay, this is not about drawing on a deep domain knowledge. And you don't update the diagrams. You don't have any non-code notation for these missing abstractions. And you certainly don't check with the business. Hey, listen, you know, we've got orders. We talked a lot about what orders do. I've decided it'd be useful if I had an order item class. Is that okay with you? That is not a phone call you're ever going to have. These abstractions are in the code. You see that in the code that there's a missing abstraction. The code tells you about it. The code screams at you about it, to be fair. And then you put them in the code. Whatever's missing, if there's a missing class, you make a class. Now the abstraction's in the code. Most people, if you were to say, hey, who's that person who's coming to speak to us this week? What, what does she do? They'll say, oh, uh, she's a trainer. And that's fair. I do a lot of teaching. I have a lot of courses on Pluralsight and elsewhere. I want people to write 21st century C++. And I put a fair amount of time and effort into that. Because I don't want people to be afraid of C++. I mean, like, if you're not careful at parties, I'll start talking about that. That's one of my things, you know. It's just okay if it's a C++ party, but it's less okay if it's like a neighborhood barbecue. And when I'm not getting paid to teach and train, I'll come in as a consultant, and sometimes it's as much a management consultant as it is a C++ consultant. The projects are in big trouble, and especially when people own code they can't maintain. And this happens more often than you might think. The last person who understood this code is gone. In some cases, I mean gone. The number of phone calls I've had that has started with telling me that they had someone who understood the code, but he died. This is a real thing. Please do not be that person. Please do not, please do not die and no one else knows how your code works. That's, that's not job security. And, uh, and I come in uh, in these situations and I, I figure out how to make code that they can understand and how to make code that they can maintain. Sometimes I have to teach them C++ so they can read their own code, but a lot of times I have to fix the code. And what I have to fix about it is generally that it is missing abstractions. That's why they can't understand it. It doesn't make any sense because it's missing abstractions. But it's important to know that the things I'm going to tell you are not just about going into legacy code. Yes, if you go into 30-year-old code, which I've had to do, you will find lots and lots of opportunities to make it better. But with what I'm going to show you, you will catch yourself doing them live. Like literally, you will press enter, and you will look at the screen, and you will realize that there is a missing abstraction in your 30-second old code. And you will provide the missing abstraction. Maybe you'll just add a comment. I really should make this a function. But maybe you'll actually make it a function. Either way, it will be better. So this is not a technique for approaching old code. It's also a technique for watching what you do right in the moment while you're doing it. So I've said missing abstractions a bunch of times. I've said I'm going to give you abstraction patterns. Most people think they know what an abstraction is. They'll say an abstraction is a class. No, a class is an abstraction. But many, many things are abstractions that are not classes. Anything with a name. Okay? The minute it can have a name, it is an abstraction. A variable is an abstraction compared to a literal. A class, a function, a file, anything with a name is an abstraction. And when we're doing those abstraction lies, we tell you that you do this to avoid repetition and to avoid duplication. And that's true. That is one of the reasons for writing an abstraction. 
It's probably not the most important. I actually think the most important is the name. But that usually comes along with it. So I live in Canada. In Canada, we work in metric, but we also work in imperial. We have to be bilingual in measurement systems as well as a little bit in languages. And imagine that I've got some code, a couple million lines of code, and all over the place it needs to convert between uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius. I could just plunk the formula in everywhere I needed it. Certainly any Canadian is, oh, you're subtracting 32. Uh, I see what's happening here. Yeah, we're going to divide by 9. We're going to multiply by 5. I know what's going on. That's Celsius and Fahrenheit. But there's a good chance that once in a while you would mess it up. You'd make a typo. You'd subtract 33 instead of 32, that kind of thing. You'd divide by 9 instead of multiplying, that kind of thing. So you make a little function, right? C to F, and another function, F to C. You don't do that because, like with sales tax, what if the rules for converting Fahrenheit to Celsius change? I'll only have to change this one function. We all know they're never going to change. But we're eliminating that repetition of the same formula over and over again, and we're giving it a name. So that if somebody reads it who doesn't know why we're subtracting 32, they can tell from the name of the function. We're actually isolating the part of the problem that converts temperature units into a place of its own where everyone else can ignore it. And isolation is a very important part of abstraction. If you take all the stuff that's related to sales tax and you put it in a place with a big sales tax sign in front of it, then everybody else can just trust, okay, that's the sales tax stuff. I don't need to understand about that. I can focus on what I came in here to change, which is that I want the total to be blue or what have you. Separating the problem out into different spaces lets different people work on different parts of it. This is just as valuable as avoiding repetition. So there's no need for something to be repeated over and over again for you to choose to put it in abstraction. Of course, the very best abstractions are the ones that you just use instead of writing. So there's a class or a function in the standard library that will give you what you need, or there's a third-party library, right? So I need to look things up in a table. I need to manipulate strings. I need to parse JSON. I need to parse command line options. That's all solved problems. I shouldn't be writing all of that. And if I find a not very good implementation of it, I should probably be ripping it out and putting in a good one. The world is now full of examples of people who discovered they were accidentally writing std rotate. Um, that seems to be a very popular thing for people to not notice they were writing. And uh, it's obviously a better plan to use the standard function than your own. In the book, we say abstraction localizes and minimizes complexity. So rather than having all those minus 32 divided by 9, whatever, smeared all over your millions of lines of code, they're all in one place. Everything else gets simpler. But the trick that you're not expecting is that often when you do that, the overall complexity disappears. Because this formula for going back and forth between Fahrenheit and Celsius or kilograms and pounds or what have you are not exactly complicated formulas. And yet, by putting them in one place, you didn't just localize the complexity, you actually make it completely disappear. So, when code is missing abstractions, it's your role to provide them. And I'm just telling you, that's going to make the code better. Why? Well, because if you have thousands of lines of code, if you have a class with 50 member variables, I'm not making any of this up, this is all real, how is that different from global mutable state? Like, really, it's not. So you provide the missing abstractions, you provide smaller things, and you get all the benefits uh, that we've always said you'll get from abstractions. The simplest thing to do, I said an abstraction, is anything with a name. If you have a magic number anywhere in your code, Make it some kind of a variable. Could be just like some local thing. Could be a member variable of a class if the, if the formula is in a member function of that class. It can be const, sure, it's a constant. It could be const expert, that's also fine. I don't really care how you spell it. What I really care about is that it gets a name. Well, but how am I going to know the name? Here's this big, long, complicated formula, and it's got a 23 and a 17 and a 48 in it. Well, chances are there's a comment right before the formula. There pretty much always is that says, you know, 17 is how many, I don't know, provinces there are in the country or something. And, and that's where that comes from. The name is almost always right there in the code because someone else has read this formula and said, 
why don't we divide by 23 here? And rather than introduce an abstraction, someone's just added a comment. Um, there's a joke about a consultant being someone who will borrow your watch to tell you what time it is. But, it, but you know, if you're walking around with a watch on going, man, I wish I knew what time it was, then you, you need a consultant who knows how to read watches for you. And I very much borrow people's watches when I look in their code, read their comments, and use that to give a variable a better name. So give your constants a better name, uh, not zero and one, like real constants, but don't reinvent the wheel. If you've got seven in your formula, don't just introduce a constant called days per week. Go off into the chrono header and see if there's something to convert between days and weeks for you already. Something that is uh, already written to handle all the weird edge cases that might appear. You want pi? Okay. Bring in the numbers header and use std numbers pi. Or square root of two or whatever other number with a name you want is probably in that header. That's more expressive to other people than your super cool arctan of minus one or whatever uh, related formula that you've come up with to calculate pi by. We'll start with a really simple one. I see this sort of thing all the time in old code. You've got uh, report. I chose report because pretty much every old system has, does reports. Used to print them, now it emails them, whatever, okay? And, and they used to just have the report. And then they're like, oh, actually, the reports are going to be a little bit different for some people than for others. So they add like a report type uh, member variable to the report class, which is fine. And uh, they decide to use these, these uh, macros for the report type names. They typically all start with a common prefix because, of course, macros are not uh, in their namespaced in any way. So RT is going to be the name for all of these ones. And then having apparently just had this well, we used up two letters. We can't be going crazy. We'll just use one or two from now on. So you have RTB, RTC, RTBC, and so on. And you know how many mistakes you can make? I mean, this is three, but that's because we're on a slide. Like in life, there's 107 or maybe 700. There's just like so many. And, and you need to copy and paste. And there are three different things you need to change, the name, the numerical value, and the comment. Ask me how often people successfully change all three. <laughs> but then, you know, you, what order do you put them in? Do you keep them in numerical order? Do you keep them in alphabetical order? How do you know? Like, if I'm just going to add another one and I want to give it the value 2006, has anyone already used 2006? There's a delightful series of bugs when, when two of these have the same numerical value, right? Because then your switches and whatnot are going into the wrong switch and you can't figure out why. There's a ton of mistakes waiting for you here. Just use an enum. Okay, now the numbers will be assigned by the compiler, so they're going to be in the right order. And uh, you can use all 26 letters of the alphabet, should you desire. Now, this is an, an old school uh, unscoped enum, which means that the names have to be unique. So I might still need to have some kind of a prefix on them, like RT basic and so forth. I normally would prefer you use an enum class, a scoped enum, but these are very often in a switch. And you can't switch on a num class without casting it back to an int first. So for that particular case, you might want to stick uh, with the old school enums, in which case you might need to put um, uh, prefixes on them so that you can tell them apart from the other kinds of basics. I meet a lot of this kind of stuff. It's super common. And the person who, who died, you know, would have been able to look over this and go, what, 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 what? No, 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 you have one of these trues and one of these falses flipped. But all the new people are like, I, I don't know the difference between these calls. At a first glance, do you notice that two of these are true in each call? It's generally a bad idea to have consecutive parameters of the same type. But it really wouldn't be better if there was one int in the middle of all of this, right? It's the sheer number of parameters that's starting uh, to make it horrible. And I find it especially frustrating if, let's say, the default is false. I really just want to turn on two of the seven options, but I have to specify those other five falses uh, because, you know, uh, defaults can only be at the end. So I've done this many times, and it helps enormously with readability. You just make a struct. And uh, in this case, I'm taking advantage of default values. I'm going to make them all false, so now I only need to set the ones that are going to be true. And I change the function to take an instance of this struct. 
It's just a struct. There's no getters. There's no setters. There's no encapsulation. And the code is pretty mechanical to change. Uh, people say, well, where'd you get those names from? Well, those will be the names of the parameters inside the function, right? Because the, the reason this, nobody sits down in that we teach abstraction lies, pre-designed stuff and says, we should totes have a function that takes seven bools. Like that was, that was not done on purpose, right? It didn't used to take anything. And then it needed one. We need a special case for Europe. So we pass in this bool of whether it's Europe or not. And then it needed another one. The year-end version is special. OK, so it adds another one. Uh, what if the notices were already sent? And we're just updating again, but we don't want to do the notices again. OK, so they just keep adding. So generally, they have pretty good names. And you just take the names of the parameters and make them the names of the elements of the struct. And then you mechanically, anywhere in the code for this update function where it said, if Europe, something or another, you go, if opt.europe and the rest of the code is unchanged. It's pretty simple to do. Then calling it looks like this. I'll set up a, an update options object, set just the things that I want to mark as true, because the rest all default to false, and call update. Now, Europe prelim is a pretty crummy name. It's really just telling you which two flags I turned on. If this was a real example, I could probably give it a better name. There's probably a particular circumstance that corresponds to its preliminary results for Europe. And it's easy to tell the difference between this one, where I'm setting two different things to true. But it's not just about parameter lists that are hard to remember, like seven bulls in a row. Sometimes people are very confidently sure that they know what your parameters mean, and they're wrong. So the classic example of this genre is draw rect. Think for a minute about what these integers mean. Probably half of you thought there was x1, y1, x2, y2. And probably half of you thought it was x, y, width, height, or maybe height, width, right? Could go many different ways. The problem is a missing abstraction. If my draw rectangle takes two points, now you know what those mean. When you make these structs, they might not end up as structs. So I've got some function that takes three strings and a float. And I decide, no, you know what? That's actually some kind of an abstraction. It's not going to be an employee or a purchase order, because those kinds of abstractions got figured out back during design. But maybe it's an employment contract. Maybe it's an order item, something like that. This function that takes a T whatever t is, maybe this should be a member function of the t class. Maybe it should. And after inventing the struct, there's nothing wrong with stopping and asking yourself that. This, is this really a free function, or is it better served to be a member function of the class you just invented? Now, you know, structs can have member functions. You know that. But most of us, once we add a member function to something, we start thinking about canonical classes. And we're like, oh, the member variable should be private. I need gets. I need sets. I'm going to need special member functions. How many constructors do I need? Oh, rule of three, rule of five. So just, like, don't rush off to do that. This code was working, right? When these were just local variables, everything was fine. The reason we have private member variables is to protect invariants. Some classes have invariants. So if I write a bank account class, and I have a transaction log, and I have a balance, if you were to start at zero and add and subtract every transaction in the history of the account, you should end up with the same number as what is in the balance. That is the invariant of the bank account class. And that's why you don't have a set balance method. You have deposit, which increases the balance and adds a transaction. You have withdraw, which decreases the balance and adds a transaction and guarantees that outside of those member functions, the invariant always holds. It is possible the structs you're inventing do hold secret invariants. Like maybe for your points, that um, x and y have to be in the same quadrant in the particular universe you're working in. In which case, you might want to actually have set methods that would deal with that. But it's more likely that there's no invariant whatsoever, which means you don't need that kind of encapsulation. You don't need getters and setters. You don't need destructors. You don't need special member functions of any kind. 
It's okay for these to just be a thing with a name. Don't run off and do design. It is a good idea to look around. I mentioned that this free function taking a T might be a member function of the new T class. It's also possible there's some other local variables that belong in that class and some other functions that take this new type that should be member functions of it. That's fine. Consider that possibility. I don't like out params. I think if you've heard me talk before, you're familiar with the fact that I don't like out params. You want to return something? Return something. It's a pretty simple rule. Oh, but I need to return three things. Oh, well, we've only had that capability, you know, for as long as we've had the language, so I can understand you might not have learned that part yet, right? You can return a struct. You can return a pair. You can return a tuple. A struct has a name, and its pieces have a name. This is all a good thing. You can write your own struct with names. Other people have written a couple of fairly handy things, optional. So if what you need is a Boolean, like this worked or not, and then a value, which is only usable if the Boolean is true, well, that's what optional does for you. Expected, can I say said expected yet? I'm getting nods from the people who, who are nod qualified. Uh, <laughs> I've been using expected for quite a while. Cybrand has a great one, but we do now have can expect stood expected, uh, which is two thingies, and it uh, knows which of them is legit. One's what you're expecting to calculate, some object or an integer, whatever, and the other is an error type. And so then if everything works, you get what you expect back in the value, and if it didn't work, you get an error in the error. That work's been done. Take advantage of that. Don't roll your own thing where you have a bunch of pointers and you return a bool, and then depending on the bool, you look at different ones of the pointers. Uh, it's much more readable for everyone if you use things that people can look up on CPP reference. That's one of the things I like about optional and expected. Uh, that plus they have some nice uh, uh, bool conversions that let you uh, say if result, and it does what you think it should do. The other thing I see, I don't have to understand the code. I don't have to know anything about running nuclear reactors. Just need to be able to pattern match is this kind of thing. Now, the older the code, the more likely it is that people declare a bunch of stuff at the beginning without uh, initializing it, and they're all clumped up together like this. But you can also spot it when they're spread out a little further. Uh, they just don't fit on slides as well. They all start with the same three letters. That I see all the time, two, three, four letters. It's because they're all parts of the same thing. In this particular case, they're all parts of an employee. That is the employee first name, the employee last name, the employee title, and the employee salary. And if you do nothing more than just gather them up into a single struct and then declare an instance of it, I mean, then you can sort of mechanically put a dot between the EMP and the first name, the EMP and the last name, and you're good to go. Often this does lead you off onto other things. But just seeing the names all starting with the same letters, it tells you that these are, in fact, one thing. And you can take advantage of that and put that information in the code. Take a look at these declarations. Again, in real life, they might be slightly more spread out. Without even looking at the variable names, you, you see something here, right? There's two clumps. There's two thingies. And when you look at them more closely, the first clump, start value, end value, number of points, average, tolerance, this is some kind of statistical something involving values. And the second clump, that's a latitude, a longitude, an altitude, visible, secure, this is about some sort of physical location. They're clearly very different. Without, I don't need domain knowledge, though. All I really need is that blank line. I, I call this a load-bearing blank line. Right? It's very clearly demonstrating these are two things. OK? You can create two classes or two structs now to hold these thingies. But look a little closer. Look at the first line of each clump. How long have we been told not to declare two variables on the same line with a comma? And then if there's a pointer involved, it confuses people. There's no pointer, but we still generally are told don't do this. 
But whoever wrote this code did this. Maybe didn't even notice that they did it. That's what I love about this. Sometimes I talk to the person who wrote it. And I say, you knew they were a thing. Start val and end val. Latitude and longitude. You knew they were a single thing. You declared them on a single line. And the person says, huh. I guess I did. Right? You're, you're sending messages to the future, but also to yourself right now. When you want to declare start val and end val on a single line like that, it's because that pairing is really one thing. Listen to yourself. Make it one thing. Now, a big part of refactoring, <laughs> oh my goodness, the big functions I've walked up to 100 lines of code. Please, you are like little baby. Uh, I used to routinely have phone calls where the person would say, so if you go to line 5,896 in such a file, you will see, and th that would be like, in the middle of a case statement that was itself hundreds of lines long, which was in, in a switch statement, which was thousands of lines long, and the file was 10 or 15,000 lines. And yeah, we had to do a lot of refactoring. But, but how do you do that? How do you know where in these thousands of lines of code to grab this 106 lines and make them a function? Blank lines. Load-bearing blank lines. There's also comments, right? The number of people who are like, pick out all the rush orders. <laughs> process the orders. <laughs> like, whoa, you're so close. So close. <laughs> Your tool will do this for you. Do not ever try to do this by hand. And you know the best part of any refactoring tool is the undo button. Okay, so you select 107 lines, maybe separated by some convenient blank lines. You say extract function. And your tool says, sure, it's going to take 11 parameters, four of which are out params. Undo. That was not the correct refactoring. You want to absolutely minimize the information flow into and out of this function you've just invented. Yes, you need to be able to give it a name. But ideally, it would take one, two, three parameters and would return a value. And depending on where you choose to select the lines, that's what's going to grow that. So when you see that it has three out params, take a look at what are the variables that are in that block of code that are still used afterwards and figure out maybe if I should select less lines at the top or less lines at the bottom or something so that it doesn't work that way. Let me take a couple tries. But again, without any knowledge of the domain, what is the grouping of these hundreds of lines of code that minimizes the parameters that are going into and out of that new function? And then you'll need to name it. But the, once you see the parameters and the return type, that often will be all you need to understand it. Oh, I'm, I'm adding up all of the totals. OK. Now, if I have a 5,000 line file and every 100-ish lines of code becomes a function, I then have a, fu a function that is 50 function calls in a row. Perhaps that itself could do with a little compression. Here's where you need some judgment, OK? Maybe you could turn it into five-ish functions, each of which calls 10-ish functions. Don't ever do this numerically or mechanically. Uh, one of my first jobs programming, I was a, an undergraduate student. And at the University of Waterloo, we do co-op. So we're put out into industry and do real jobs. And, uh, and I was working in industry in Fortran. And the person there who was in charge of us was, to my mind, very old and experienced. I mean, she probably was 24, 25 years old. Uh, and she knew everything. <coughs> and one of her rules was no function could be more than 20 lines long. So if you wrote a 21-line function, we didn't know any better, and it seems that she didn't know any better. The first 20 lines would be called like calc 1, and the last line would be called like calc 2, and then you just call calc 1 followed by calc 2. Please don't ever do that. So when I say like 5 and 10, I don't mean any of these numbers precisely. But would it make sense to take your 50 function calls and clump them up a bit? Yes, if you can give the clumps names, if that gives value. If this nine function calls are all about permission, and these 12 down here are all about, I don't know, sending emails or something, then you can give them names, then that's a good thing to do. If it's just going to add confusion, if it's just going to add another level of indirection, then don't do it. Just give me the 50 function calls. I think it's unlikely that none of them have any commonality, 
but don't invent abstraction that doesn't have a name, that doesn't have a purpose, that doesn't add clarity. Remember, we're trying to reduce repetition. We're trying to reduce duplication. We're also trying to isolate parts of the problem. I saw this on Twitter recently. Someone was complaining about comments at the end of a, a long series of nested things that ended with closed braces. So you said, while, somewhere inside the while there's an if, it's like a couple hundred lines in the if, then inside one, maybe the if, maybe the else, there's like a for loop. And it gets to the point where somebody feels the need to label the closed braces. This is the end of the for, this is the end of the if, this is the end of the while. And the original assertion on Twitter was that they were pointless, they were just noise, they should be deleted. And my statement was, no, 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 no. It's telling you it's too long, and too nested. Don't just delete them, use them. Because very often, when I used to do this, I would just copy the original if and put that in the comment. But kids these days are way more hardworking than that. They paraphrase the condition. They're telling you the name of the function that you're going to use to put inside where these braces were, okay? It's got a name. We're, get, we're, we're processing each outstanding item, or this is what you do when you're over limit. Fantastic. Does the if go in the function, or is it if function? Yeah, that's gonna be a judgment call on your part. A Couple different ways to do it. Here's a situation using reports as an example again, and I apologize for the font size, but I'll read it to you. Uh, for every R in reports, and then there's a closed brace way down at the bottom of the screen. If, we'll call R's header needed, R dot, R points to do header. So imagine this didn't used to say do header, it used to be 20 lines of code. Then we do some little local calculations about how many lines are gonna be in the report, and then while, for each line, well, again, R dot, points to a new line was maybe 100 lines of code. And that's why we needed to have comments on the close brace of that while. And then we have another if about if you need a footer. So this is a simple way to do it. Keep your ifs, keep your whiles, keep all your nesting. But just take whatever was between the braces and make it a function. Because of the scoping of braces, the chances are you'll have really limited parameter action when you pick these out into functions. These are member functions. They're only working with member variables. It's fine. So this isn't wrong, but you might prefer to do this. So what this says is, you know what? I don't know who this code is that's looping through all the reports, but why does it need to know whether a report needs a header or not? Why is that the business of this calling code? When you think about encapsulation and abstraction and keeping like with like, sure, reports know whether they need headers or not. But why does external code need to say, hey, do you need a header? In that case, do your header. Maybe we better just say, do your header. And some reports would be, I'm good, right? They don't need a header, they just return. That works. Why does the external code need to know how many lines there are in the body of the report? Just do your body. I mean, I'm making these functions up. So I can make them up however I like. So these are both right. Some people, when they see that one, they go, why does the calling code need to know there is a header, then there's the body, then there's a footer? Why don't we just have do report? And I'm not going to argue. That's what happens when you start putting missing abstractions in. As the code gets simpler and you can understand it, then you can say things like, I got business logic in the wrong place. The logic that says a report starts with a header, then there's a body, then there's a footer, that's report talk. That belongs inside report. Why does some code that's not in report, knowing that? and your instructions get better. It's very common to find, especially in older code, but it happens in newer code too, classes that are very similar, but only similar, right? And going through and bringing inheritance into play can make a real difference here. Now, this doesn't have to mean polymorphism and indirection and virtual functions. This can be your common or garden implementation inheritance. You're already using what John Lamb calls editor inheritance. It's copy, paste. The problem with editor inheritance is you don't necessarily edit the same for the history of time, right? 
So imagine that you have like an old system that sent faxes, and there's a class called fax. And roughly 20 years ago, somebody also wanted this thing to be able to send emails, so they made a class called email using editor inheritance. They copied uh, fax.h and fax.cpp to email.h and email.cpp, and then went through effectively with a crayon crossing out fax and writing an email. And then they made a few changes because faxes go to phone numbers, but emails go to addresses. Maybe emails can be CC'd, that kind of thing. They made a few changes. And then over time, these two classes have been living in parallel. Maybe there's not two now. Maybe there's seven, right? Because maybe in addition to faxes and emails, you can also send texts and WhatsApps and whatever else. And it's starting to bother people. When you need to make a change, that you need to make that same change in seven places. So if you put all the commonality in a base class and then have each of the derived classes just only override what's different for them, maybe some of the times when you need to make changes, you only need to make it in the one place in the base class instead of the seven different places uh, in these what are now derived classes but used to be independent, just similar classes. This can be a wonderful way to fix mystery bugs. It can also be a way to get the business very mad at you. And you need to know this is one of the few times when you need to check with the business. Imagine that you can export as XML and as JSON. And you discover the XML exports include the sales tax and the JSON reports do not. Feels like a bug, right? You're going to be a hero. You're going to fix the bug. You're going to get a phone call. It's pretty common to hear, oh yeah, we, we had a new customer and they wanted it in JSON, but they also wanted the sales tax included. So we just have the JSON export include the sales tax for them. And the old customers, they didn't want the sales tax, they're still just using the XML report. As common as dirt. What appears to be a simple format difference is actually a business rule difference. The PDF reports have subtotals and the, and the HTML reports don't because they're for different external or internal customers. So when you find this similar stuff, you bring it together and you're going to make everything consistent, you need to phone someone or email someone or Slack someone or Discord someone or whatever and say, is it deliberate that they're inconsistent in this way? And you may have to encode that. And then, harking back to my naming talk, you might want to change the names, right? But the difference between these two exports is not just that one's XML and one's JSON but that one has sales tax and one doesn't, you can put that in their names. They can be called like XML with sales tax and JSON without sales tax. And now people will understand this is a deliberate choice. How many of you want to do this bit? Want to write a template? Anyone? The, the front row, few, few people in the front row, yeah, I told you, right, I'm writing a template. Everyone else is like, no. Look, I'll do a lot of things but I'm not going to become one of those template writing people. I get it. I get it. I do. And, and, and that's fine. There are other things you could do. If you've got a bunch of very similar functions, you could find some base class of whatever this thing works with and have your function just take that. So I'll have to write it once and I'll call derived functions. And that's better than having seven versions of my function. I'll have one that works with something they have in common. That can be the right choice. I can find Maybe not something they all are, but something they all have. So think about the STL, which I know is a template, so maybe not a good example, but they work, they don't work with containers, they work with iterators, right? And all the containers have iterators. So is there something like that that you could do? Instead of having your function take a document, it could take the text that's in the document and work that way. Or I could write a helper function and all my similar functions could all call the helper function. And those aren't wrong. If you are thinking of doing those things, go ahead. But templates are often cleaner. Let me choose the world's simplest example of adding. I have a function called add int that takes two integers and returns an integer. And then I have another function called add colors. I don't know quite what that would mean, but it takes two colors and returns a color. And add string returns a string. There's no natural commonality. Right? You can't say it, these are all addables or something and then call their derived plus function. Like that. That's just weird. Okay? And there's also the problem of the return type. If I make this take something vague, 
and then I call it with two strings, then I have to cast whatever I get back because I know it's really a string because I called it with two strings. Like, that's kind of getting gross. But if you make a template, it takes two T's and returns a T, you're done. It's cleaner. So if you're really tying yourself in knots, and especially if you're tying yourself in knots around return types, consider writing a template. I swear it does not hurt. I have written templates. It didn't hurt. It's sometimes very, very cool. So although you wouldn't maybe reach for it, I want to encourage you to think about it. And I love this example. This comes from the book. Guy wrote this. If we're on Windows and you want to know whether the letter A was pressed or not, you call a global function called get key state, passing in the single character A. You bitwise and that with 8,000, because of course you do. And uh, if that's non-zero, then someone press the letter A. Uh, for Linux, he wasn't prepared to even write it down. <laughs> and you will see this stuff sprinkled throughout user interface code. If you have a function that's, on average, a couple dozen lines long, it'll probably be only once in each function, but there might be 10 different functions in the same file that have this check in them. And of course, you're not just checking for whether or not the letter A was pressed. You have another check for whether or not someone's pressed control something or another, and all the different platform-specific things you might need to check for. And the key to what I'm going to show you as an abstraction is to understand that I mispronounced the if. Most of us pronounce this if as if we are running on Windows. If we're on Windows. That's not what's being checked for. It's not a runtime check. If we are building for Windows. And that changes everything. Make a file, actually make several files, called, for example, keypress.h. The Windows version of keypress.h does the get key state thing. The Linux version of keypress.h does the complicated thing. But they both think declaring this function called key state. User code just calls key state after including keypress.h. Your build system makes sure the right header gets included. Because that's how those flags got set. Right? When you're building for Windows, you set the Win32 flag. When you're building for Linux, you set the Linux flag. Well, why not, when you're building for Windows, include the Windows version of keypress.h? When you're building for Linux, include the Linux version. Oh, all of a sudden, you can actually support three platforms without trying to deal with what is effectively a switch statement in preprocessor includes, because you could just have three files. And all of the Windows stuff is in one file. All of the Linux stuff is in one file. It's a beautiful example of isolation. Your Windows-aware person maintains the Windows file. Your Linux-aware person maintains the Linux file. And everybody else can ignore it. They're just calling key state. Then a miracle occurs. I don't know why it works, but it works. It comes from realizing that the if is not testing what we're running on, but what we're building for. And we have better ways of building for different platforms than we used to have. I love this example as a way to eliminate complexity entirely. There, there is no complexity when you're, when you're done. Once you understand that which keypress.h got included is chosen by your build system. Now, I mentioned the idea of a report type, and it's, it's common as dirt. You have an account type, a report type, a document type, a whatever. It's not wrong. Classes have a type member variable all the time. And it lets you, every once in a while, do special things for special kinds of accounts or special kinds of reports. Where it starts to hurt is as everything grows. You go from having two types to having 20 types to having 200 types. And you go from having mostly commonality with a little bit of special handling to pretty much all special handling. And that's when the type approach is probably not helping you anymore. A switch statement that fits on a screen is useful, better than a bunch of ifs. A switch statement that is 5,000 lines long, not so much. And especially when you find functions where there is no commonality, where the entire thing is just a switch statement. This was the dream, if you will, 
I'm going to print the header of this report, and this would be no different if it was a member function of report. Okay. I'm going to have a bunch of common stuff, 50, 100 lines of commonality at the top, 50, 100 lines of commonality at the bottom, and then this one little switch for just this special stuff to have the basic header, the customer header, the big customer header. This is using the same enum that I invented half an hour ago for the defines. Fine. That's like 10 lines. There's 50 lines above it, 50 lines below it. It's just a little diversion. No big deal. When there's three report types. When there's 200 report types, things get kind of yuckier. And especially when there's 200 report types and most of them do the same things as each other. This is a very, very simplified version of stuff I saw in real life. I have a function called footer needed, which you uh, saw being used in the uh, nested fours and whiles. All it is is a switch. There's nothing in there besides the switch. And we have these different case statements, but all it can do is return true or false. So if there are 200 report types, and there often are, this means case, do, 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 100 case statements in a row return true. And then case something else in another 100 or so return uh, case statements in a row, and then return false. That's really nasty. Where do you put them? Like when I have to add a new one, what order do I add them in? Are they alphabetical? Are they numerical according to the old numerical defines we aren't using anymore? Like, <laughs> and maybe someone already added it. That's fun. Uh, and you notice we have this assert false now down at the bottom, which is something that developers put in to protect themselves because there's footer needed, there's header needed, there's 12, 20 different functions. You have to remember to add cases to all of them. So you have the assert so that if you forget, uh, it'll catch it for you. And I know there are now uh, compiler settings to do that for you, but this sample code comes from before that time. And this is hard to maintain. It's also almost impossible to read. Like if someone says, I'm not getting a footer on the uh, report for such a customer. And you go and you look and you see that it's a big customer report. Answering a simple question like, are we supposed to have a footer on the big customer report can be reasonably difficult to do. And I faced this with a real customer. They had a simple 21-step procedure for adding a new report. And it was simple because I wrote it up for them. What they had before was you phone someone and they walk you through it for several hours. So it was a huge improvement that I wrote up their 21-step procedure, but we obviously needed to make it simpler than that. And so we had this class report already, and all I did was make the individual specific reports derive from report and added little tiny overrides, like here, footer needed, return false. That's easy to read. If you want to know whether the, the Europe basic report includes footers or not, pretty easy to go and read this function and say, that looks like a no. Much easier than the old switch approach. And uh, the two ways you can come up with this. One is, if it's always true, if all reports have footers except for the three weirdos, then you can have a implementation in the base class that returns true and only override it for the three weirdos, which will make it really obvious for people who are trying to answer the question. Or if you're worried you'll forget, you can make it pure virtual in the base class, and then the compiler will tell you that you forgot to implement the pure virtual function in the drive class. Either way, much simpler than putting assert falses in the defaults of switches. And I have to tell you, I did that in real life, and it worked beautifully, and it took the effort to add new reports down by, by much less than half. It was much, much quicker afterwards, and it made a difference because they charged customers for adding reports. So it let them either make more profit or charge less, depending on how you want to look at it. Sometimes when I insist on good names for things, the truth comes out that the reason something doesn't have a good name is because it's not really a good sized abstraction. Functions that are called update and process and do it, and classes that are called stuff and data and information. Oh, you all act like you never wrote one, but I know you did. The reason you can't name them is they're the wrong size, and you should maybe split it up. What does it keep track of? What does it do? This is all the way back to like CRC cards from 40 years ago. But if it's doing more than one thing, it probably is more than one thing. How are you going to break it up? White space is again your friend. Sometimes there's comments, but there doesn't have to be. 
So here's all our private member variables, and here's a blank line, and then there's some more private member variables. Why? That is a note from the past. Maybe it's only from yesterday, but it's a note from the past, right? Two thingies. Here's all our public member functions. Oh, sure, look, your special ones, your constructors, your destructors, da -da -da, then a blank line, then the good stuff. I get that. But why is your good stuff broken into two pieces? Because there's two pieces, right? I'm boring your watch to tell you what time it is, but you know, well, okay, I'm showing you how to read watches. This is how it's done. Same with the gaps between the blocks of the code when you implement those functions. It's telling you about the grouping. All you need to do is read it. But, people say to me, why, why are you breaking up my beautiful information? It's, it's so easy. That's, that's why I'm breaking it up. Because it's so easy. Okay? Because you just start using stuff. Like, hey, look, the font is right there. I'm going to use the font. That's going to be helpful. And you're taking a chance that you're breaking something else. We already say we don't want global mutable state. Why? It's so easy. If all our variables were globals, how easy life would be? No, because we would break stuff. When you separate things, you have a better design. When you have encapsulation, you have a better design. And when you're explicit about what's going across boundaries and you minimize what goes across boundaries, you have a better design. So imagine I have a class that represents an employee and it's full of stuff about that person as a human being their name, their birth date, uh, where they live. It's stuff about their business relationship with you, your employee, their salary, how many hours they've worked this year, how much vacation they've used. And then some stuff about your and their shared relationship with the government. <clears throat> how many taxes you've already taken off and sent to the government on their behalf, that kind of thing. These are three like separate things. If you have code that sends people birthday cards, I have vendors who send me birthday cards I find really creepy. I didn't give them my birthday so they could send me cards, but they do. But if you're going to send your employees birthday cards, it's different from writing up their tax paperwork at the end of the year, right? So you say, I'm going to split my employee class into these three functions. That's great. But then, or into these three subclasses. But then where do I keep the functions? So chances are you're going to make a class called personal employee, personal information. Employee will have a member variable, PI, which is their personal information and another one with their tax stuff, and another one with their salary stuff. And I need to write your tax slip at the end of the year. So that's a function in employee right now. Will I move it into one of these aggregated classes? Well, probably not, because there's outside code calling it, but I might just delegate, right? The, the function sitting in employee might do nothing but call the tax slips uh, prepare method. But is it the tax slips prepare method or is it the personal information's method? Like you have to make a decision. Most of the time it can be as simple as numerically. I use seven things from this new smaller class and none from the others. Well, I guess it's a member function of that. Where it's kind of balanced, like your tax slip has your name and address on it, which is your personal information. Yeah, but this is about your taxes, right? So it goes in the taxes class. Making the information that you're passing around obvious alerts you when you're taking a dependency that maybe you should not be taking. That's what's best about a good splitting up. Why do I need my home address to print my tax slip? Well, that's easy. In Canada, we're supposed to print the home address on the tax slip. Okay. But maybe in some other countries, you don't do that. So you're like, why are you passing personal information in? You don't have to rearrange the inside of the class it may be enough to rearrange those getters and setters that I said you shouldn't have run off to write. Imagine a huge class with all these getters. This has got something to do with uh, displaying text on a screen probably, right? We've got some XY coordinates, foreground and background color, actual text. And we have dozens of gets, dozens of sets, and then presumably a whole pile of like business logic as well. If you just Leave the member variables alone, but change these gets so that they return little abstractions like location and appearance. It's much more obvious that you need to call them kind of in clumps. Probably everyone was calling get x immediately then called get y. Why not make a single call to location and get the x and y? But only the x and y. If you want to know the colors, you need to make another call. 
makes it more obvious which things are using what out of this big interface. And this is about the constant change. If I need another parameter where I used to call get x and get y, I just, well, I'll just call get text now without really thinking. Now I have to think about it. Why do I need more information? Should I change location? Should there be more stuff in location that I could call? It gives you better design. Because when we're in a hurry, we just make it work. The idea behind abstraction is to protect you from accidental dependencies and rippling changes. And that's why you're putting these in place. I see that I very carefully arranged for power and then didn't actually, you know, plug it into my laptop. There you go. <laughs> okay. That's all right. I know what you need to do. Uh, did you see it? It said call to action for a minute. Uh, and I will try to wake it up for the sake of the recording. Oh, it's really unhappy now. Um, what I want you to do is to listen to the code when it's telling you that there are abstractions that are missing. Okay, whether you wrote it or whether you're just reading it, it is telling you there's missing abstractions. And when you provide those missing abstractions, you're going to make the code better for you and for future people. You don't need to understand sales tax, nuclear reactors, chemical refineries, rental car business. You just need to look for those load-bearing white spaces those names that are so similar for what's clumped together and what's separate. And, the, and then just listen to the code. Now, don't be super mechanical about it. You do bring judgment to this. It is still important to be a designer and be able to put things together correctly. But uh, don't be overwhelmed by it uh, just automatically and say, well, I couldn't possibly because I, don't, I could never design this system from scratch. That's fine. You don't have to design this system from scratch. You just have to listen to what the code is telling you. And most importantly, as you write stuff, you could leave some notes for the future, some blank lines, some comments, but you could also just take that note right now and work on it and make the code better right now, and that would be uh, even better. Once you know to see them, those blank lines, those gaps, they are absolutely screaming at you, and all you got to do is listen, and I encourage you to do just that and look through your code abstraction patterns. Thank you.